with our camping trip weather. We do need to pray that we don't get rained out Saturday night. But um, it looks like today a high of 82, which will be really great for boating and swimming. And tomorrow, 76. At least that was the last I heard. And that's pretty nice, too. So we're excited. Um, we will have the opportunity while we are camping to do some community service for the camp site area or trails. So um, I'm looking forward to that too. I think that'll be fun. I have a number of different announcements that I want you to um, particularly pay attention to. One of them involves vocational scheduling. There seems to be a little bit of a misunderstanding that I can volunteer and work in an area and then take off my extra time in my regular area. That's not accurate. Um, if you want to volunteer, volunteer is volunteer. Free gratis. Uh, it's not a time type thing. Unless Mrs. Riddle has placed you in an area or given permission for that, you really cannot be working in that area and accruing any time for it. So um, we appreciate willingness to help, but it doesn't count unless that has been approved by Mrs. Riddle. It doesn't count for your vocational hours. Thanksgiving break. Uh, we, are, we are looking forward to Thanksgiving break, as I know you are too. Uh, Thanksgiving break is going to begin on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. We are going to have Sunday classes that week. And prior to Thanksgiving break, we're going to have finals for as much as your classes have covered for that period. And then after Thanksgiving break, which actually ends on Monday, um, you will start Zoom classes for about six classes. And if you have a problem with Zoom, if you will meet with Mr. Neal sometime between now and a week or so before you leave, let us give you some suggestions for that. Um, even though today is going to be in the 80s, the rest of the week won't all be that warm. It's going to be in the 40s at night uh, and early mornings, which means when you're sitting out trying to eat breakfast, it, it, it could be pretty cold <laughs> if you're not dressed well. So make sure you have packed your jacket. The girls have leggings and socks. Bare feet are not part of being dressed for the weather. Um, and that you take some tennis shoes, not just sandals. You will need tennis shoes. It is so nice to have special music. I love listening to you all sing or play. We do have a procedure if you are the Sabbath school um, teacher, for instance, not teacher, but superintendent, arranging for special music or in some other way, you're speaking and you're arranging for special music to go along with your sermon, that's great, but the special music needs to be auditioned to Mrs. Martin by the Wednesday prior to that Friday night or Sabbath. And I think we haven't made that clear uh, in talking before, so I just want to make sure that you are aware of that. Between five and six, you have the opportunity to um, have internet time when you're not in a choir. Um, but internet time involves the computer room and the uh, library. 
It doesn't involve the hall, the, mus the auditorium, the music area. During five to six, no one should be in those areas. If you happen to be on the DF&I list, which I hope you're not, and if you are, then I hope you're working diligently to be off of it by the nine weeks, then this building is off limits for you altogether between five and six. Any questions about that? Mm, I'm not sure what you're saying. Between five and six, well, yes, if you're in a choir, obviously here, but as far as otherwise, um, you don't come into the ad building during that time. Yeah, if they can't be in here, they can't be in here. Yeah, for practice or any other reason. Um, and the pianos, I think they both at least this one I know has a sign on it. Um, let me just read it so we can be clear. It says OH Auditorium Grand Piano Use Guidelines. So that's for both. This is a special piano in a special place in order to encourage a worshipful atmosphere and preserve the piano in the best possible tuning and condition. The piano should be used only for the following purposes and specified times. It should not be used for general practice or playing on. The following are approved purposes. Official music lessons, choir practices, official school programs and services, supervised practice of groups for special music or special permission which I give. There are music practice rooms that are available for practice for specific needs and approved times. General playing piano should be do done in the dormitories. So if you will remember that, we would appreciate it. Okay, the last thing I just wanted to mention is that we do have a little bit of a challenge trying to um, schedule the boating and and all that is involved, whether you choose to tube or to kneeboard or to ski, um, and getting it all in two afternoons because that's going to be the warmest day, the warmest time of the day. And we have two days that are going to be pretty warm. So we are separating you out um, and having the girls go this afternoon. The guys will be helping to do the final loading, cleaning the calf, and that sort of thing. Uh, coming back, the girls will get to do the unloading and the cleaning of the calf and putting away of items, and the guys will have the time off. Um, but we really need you to be ready to go, young ladies, at one, so we can maximize the time you're out and enjoying the lake. Um, so make sure that you bring your you have half an hour um, less vocational time. Make sure you bring all your things that are going, other than the clothes you need to change into for the lake and, and after you're done at the lake. Bring everything here to the calf, not here, to the calf, so that you can um, then leave and be ready to go to one, and if you'll meet at the cafeteria at one. Okay, any questions about today or anything else I've gone over? Yes, ma'am. For the tents? No, I think Mrs. Reed will probably do that. I don't usually do it. Okay, yes. I don't know. How many in a tent? Uh, usually f at least four. In the bigger tents, five. Hmm? Um, you'll need to talk to Mrs. Reed. Sorry, I'm not trying to evade the question. I just can't answer it. Yes? What are we doing what? Boat. But we're going on the lake in a boat. 
and you'll have choices. You'll each have about 10 minutes. Um, we can only put eight in a boat, and so each of you will have about 10 minutes to, and you can choose in advance if you want to um, tube, if you want to ski, if you want to kneeboard, we have all those things, and drivers that will help you learn if you haven't, but you only still have about 10 minutes, and then you have to switch out. Now, if two of you want to tube together, you can, so you have longer, you're right, double. Um, Livia? Are you what? I'm sorry, I'm... Do you need to take your masks? Is that what you're asking? Um, I, I don't think you have to take your mask. Um, I do think that you need to not be all together as close as you can be. You know, do a little social distancing. But we're going to be outside for the most part. We're not going to ask you to sleep with a mask when you're together in a tent. So I don't, I don't know why you would have to take a mask. Yes, sir. Say it again. I would think your dean would. Make sure you, if you don't have a, a tent, I mean a sleeping bag, and it's up in the attic, the ones we're getting for you, make sure that that is down and being taken. And, um, pardon? An extra blanket would be handy, possibly, unless you have a sleeping bag that's well rated for cold weather. And most of the ones the school has are not. Sorry. Okay, let's pray. How many of you have pads to go under your sleeping bags? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they're here. Okay, so that's seven of the students. I would take them all because I imagine some staff don't. So, but we need at least 16 for students. Okay, let's pray. You'll kneel with me, please. Thank you, Father in heaven, for all that you do for us. We come in your presence because you've invited us and because there's so many blessings that we receive when we come. I pray that you will bless us um, during this assembly, that you'll be with Mr. Neal as he speaks. May we understand clearly our responsibilities for this world and this ministry and for our homes, for our church, for your work. I pray too, Lord, that you will bless this weekend. I just feel so thankful that um, we have this opportunity to go and have such nice camping weather. I pray that you'll help us to stay well and to be able to not only enjoy the time we're out, but to enjoy the time when we get back that we will, won't be sick and that we will be able to um, be refreshed to meet the re responsibilities of the new school week. And I thank you because you're interested in all the details of our lives and you bless us so abundantly. In Christ's name I pray, amen. We are living certainly in 
times when we are dealing with a crisis that is coming. You know, in our history, uh, crises have come about in many ways. October 24, 1929, the Great Depression hit almost out of the blue, not really, after the Roaring Twenties. And then you had uh, Pearl Harbor, World War I, we were pushed into a crisis, November 22, 1963, the death of Kennedy, and, and September 11, 2001, everything changed in our world's history, and we are living uh, in uh, May 22, 2011. Anyone remembered what happened then? They come with blurring, I can't recall, but there are so many blurring things that happen, and we are living in the current midst of another crisis, Perhaps um, whether or not it'll bring in the last day events or whether or not things will settle out, we don't know. But nonetheless, we are living in that. You know, the Bible just tells us in, in Daniel um, chapter 11, 12 rather, that when we anticipate crises, they are often worse. Well, let me share this quotation with you. Um, the time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us and we shall need an experience which we do not now possess and which are too indolent to obtain. It is often the case that trouble is, in, is greater in anticipation than reality. Usually trouble, we worry about it and we anticipate it and it, we think it is far worse than when it actually comes, it's not as bad. But we are told, but this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal in that time of trial every soul must stand himself before God and that's what Daniel is describing in Daniel chapter 12 when it says that at that time Michael shall stand up and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time and at that time your people shall be delivered now, sometimes when we hear this type of information, though, we get, we get nervous and scared. Is it something to worry about? It's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. Think about what has happened in the past, times of trouble. Has it been bad? What is this going to be? It's going to be worse. Is that something to at least be concerned about? <laughs> we, you and I, if we are alive are gonna go through a time of trouble such as never was since there has been a nation. And we are told the most vivid presentation cannot it, 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 it picture, and you can picture some bad stuff, can't you? <laughs> so granted, there's gonna be some bad things come. It doesn't mean that, that we are, God's people are gonna be delivered and not gonna have a hard time. We are gonna have a hard time. God's people, the whole world is gonna have a hard time to some descent. Now God's people are gonna be delivered, the Bible says, and he's gonna go with us through that time. But we are told specifically um, we should be preparing for this. Transgression has almost reached its limits. Confusion fills the world, and a great terror will soon come upon the human beings. <clears throat> the end is very near. He who knows the truth should be preparing for what will soon break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. One of these days, and we're, we're in the midst of it. I don't know. I mean, sometimes I think this COVID-19 is a drop in the bucket, really, for what's coming. And one of these days, we're going to wake up, and boom, everything's going to, it's going to be an overwhelming surprise. I mean, Sure, COVID-19 kind of hit was an overwhelming surprise. We weren't anticipating it, but it's nothing compared to what we are at least depicted may come soon. And so Christians should be preparing for this what will break on the world is overwhelming surprise. And this preparation they should make by diligently studying the word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. There is one preparation, the only preparation we can make, and that's not prepping. It's not moving out into the country and growing your own food, even though those are important things that are good. It is this. This is the only thing. Only those that have fortified their minds with the truths of God's word will be able to stand in the last great day. This is it. This is it. If we don't study this and know it and, and understand it for ourselves, when it comes, we're going to be swept away. We're going to... We're going we're gonna to go with the tide, and this is where we have to spend our time, and that's why even this weekend, as we have opportunity to get out in nature, you know, what do you bring with you when you go out and camping? Bring it. You don't want to leave home without it. It's, it's, it's what we have to do. Now, one of the passages in Scripture... And thinking about preparing for that time, there's some counsel that we've been giving about what we should do and how we should live today, and especially the school setting, that uh, I want to briefly go over this morning. 
And uh, Jesus in Luke 16, verse 10, you all are familiar with this text, although you probably don't know you're familiar with it. it said, he said, he that is faithful in that which is, is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in that which is, is faithful also in and the Bible principle is that if we're going to prepare for this great overwhelming event, and by the way, yeah, we, we, we shouldn't fear the event. We should prepare for it. Does that make sense? Don't be a scra- scared of what's coming. Just get ready for it. And you do that by studying God's word and surrendering your heart to him so that he's going to lead you through it. Because if you're not with him, it's going to be bad. If you're with him, it'll be bad. But you'll have somebody to lead you through, <laughs> Right? And you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about the event. Even though, yes, it is going to be trouble. We just prepare for it. Okay, so, and one of the ways we do that is by being faithful today in, the only way we're going to be faithful in the big things is to be faithful today in the, in the little things that he gives us. And so this is the preparation that God has given us for us to do. Now, I thought this was rather cute. <laughs> it's the day-to-day stuff, isn't it? That really trips us up. Don't worry about the crisis. Deal with today, with the things that God has given us in the, sm- in the small things. Now, a story that Jesus gave, a favorite of mine in scriptures, and it's the only story, the only gospel story outside of, the, of a few, the birth of Christ and the, and the death of Christ that are found in all four gospels. The only miracle, the only um, parable, the only basically recorded in all four gospels. And it's right in the center. It's like the apex of Christ's ministry. Uh, and it was the event that Christ did that really set him, well, both in excitement first to the cross, uh, the, the hatred of the Jews to go to the cross, but then also of the Jews that, uh, believing in him, many of them anyway, that he was the Messiah. And it is found in, you could find it in all four Gospels, but Matthew chapter 14. And it is, of course, the what? Feeding of the 5,000. And this story is a remarkable story. I wish we had time to really pull out lessons from it, which maybe we'll have to come to another time. But if you were that little lad, if you were the little boy who had the lunch of five loaves and two fishes, and you brought your, and and, and Andrew comes, wasn't it Andrew or was it Philip? It was Andrew that came to him and said, you know, little lad, you have a lunch there. Would you mind sharing your lunch with Jesus? And he thought, Jesus wants it. And what was he going to do? He gave it to Jesus. And what did he do when he gave it to Jesus? I think, this is my imagination, that he thought he wasn't going to get any. I think he thought, okay, Jesus gets it, I don't get any. And he was willing to do that. So little Loud was willing to go hungry to give his lunch to Jesus. And so he did. He gave it to Jesus. And Jesus, I don't know what Jesus did. He, I can only imagine he looked at the little boy and before he did anything with the lunch, he said something to the little boy. You think he did? What do you think he said? Thank you. He, did. he knew what that boy was going to get, but he also knew what that boy was giving up. Because that boy was giving up his hunger to Jesus. He was going to go hungry, and he was giving his all, his very best to Jesus. And I'm sure Jesus had this smile that made that little boy kind of like, tingle all down his spine. <laughs> Jesus gave it to him. And here's this huge crowd, Jesus on the mountainside. Now I like this picture uh, found there uh, that shows Jesus and who's sitting next to Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> what did that, that little boy get to do after Jesus blessed and multiplied the food? I think he got to eat with Jesus. <laughs> He sat there right beside Jesus. He and Jesus, while the disciples are out giving out the food and blessing all the multitude, Jesus is spending time now with this little boy. <laughs> hey, what, would, what, did you, what do you like? Do you have any pets at home? <laughs> and Jesus is spending time eating this lunch with this little boy because Jesus, you know, he blessed the food. I don't know, maybe Jesus kept bless, blessing it and giving it out or maybe he just gave it to the disciples and then it just kept multiplying as they go and they didn't have to come back for a reload. I don't know how it happened exactly, but I kind of imagine, I like that picture anyway. Here's that little lad looking around and if you can imagine, he gives a, to Jesus and Jesus gets the lunch and then he, 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 little lad knows what's in there. Seven loaves, what? Uh, five loaves and two fishes. And he knows what's in there. And so when Jesus blesses it and he starts passing it out, he, he's counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
<laughs> and little, uh, little, he's the only one that knows what's in that lunch. And his eyes get real big. He's like, wait a second, there's not seven, there's not eight, not nine, ten, nine. there's not that in there. And he gets real excited. And then, and then he's just standing there. I don't even know if little lad ever ate because he was probably so excited. He's watching all these people eat his lunch. And he's just like, yeah, maybe he's just so excited that he doesn't even get to eat. <laughs> you ever been so excited about something you, you lost your hunger? <laughs> He might have been that way. He might have just been there, just amazed. Everything's going on, just watching and every, all this food going out. He's just excited. He's sitting there with Jesus, and this is life. This is heaven. <laughs> He's with Jesus, and everybody's eating his food. Now, um, now the amazing thing is, little lad, um, he, he um, what do you think little, little lad went home with? How much? Do you think he went home with five loaves and two fishes? How much do you think he went home with? <laughs> I think he went home with more. He went with five loaves, he ate, and he went home with more than five loaves and two fishes. And the only reason I think that is because the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you. Press down good measure, shaken together, and running over. And I can only imagine the little lad gave it to Jesus, he thought he was going to go hungry, Instead, he ate all he wanted, he needed, and then after Jesus said, pick up the fragments, that nothing be lost, and what did they gather? Twelve basketfuls of those loaves and fishes. And I'm sure Jesus said, yeah, little lad, thanks so much. Here's some food for you to take home to your mom. <laughs> and he probably gave him more than five loaves and two fishes, so that when little lad went home, what did he have a testimony? What could he do with his, with his mom? <laughs> mom, you're not going to believe what happened. Man, I went to the name, blah, blah, blah. And he would just spill it off. Mom's like, hey, slow down, slow down. Tell me, start over, right? I can't understand everything. I, I, blah, blah. And he was, he, was just, he was just so excited, right? And so here it is. And then look, I had five loaves and two fishes. Now I'm coming back with 10 and four, you know, twice as much. And I have it. And, and her, her eyes get real big and she eats it. And maybe it was better than the first, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But... It was this incredible experience, this incredible experience that little had we had when he gave all that he had and he got and he was blessed. But there's a very important lesson in this story that we are not to overlook, we are told. It's a very important lesson. Christ once gave the disciple a lesson on economy which is worthy of careful attention. The lessons of Jesus Christ are to be carried out into every phrase of practical life. Economy is to be practiced in all things. Gather up the fragments, we are told in that passage, that nothing be what? Because here is this story, and when they had 12 over, they could have just sent everybody home, but they didn't. They actually gathered up the fragments that nothing be lost. Why were there only 12 baskets left over? Because there were only 12 disciples. And each one had one responsibility, and each one was to gather food. And when they gathered 12 baskets, they ended. There was nothing left over. He could have, Jesus could have made it so that there was nothing left over. They fasted, the last person got his, his lunch, his, and, and that was it. There was no more left. Nothing to gather up. Couldn't he have done that? Instead, Jesus made it so there was just enough that each disciple could gather up the fragments and nothing be lost. Because he wanted to teach a very important lesson. That whenever, God, whenever we receive blessings, whenever we have anything that God has given us as a resource, that we are to practice this, we are told. This is a, a lesson worthy of careful attention. That you and I, as we prepare for a crisis that is soon to come upon this world as overwhelming surprise, such as never was, we have to be faithful in little things, and we are told in this area, this is an area where we should practice and learn, because if we don't, well, I'm afraid that we will find suffering soon to come upon us, maybe of our own making. Some think that beneath, it is beneath their dignity to look after small things. They think the evidence of a narrow mind and niggardly spirit, that means they're, they're, they're paying attention with small things. Do you remember what Jesus was? He, was? he was particular about what two things that they made him, the life and teachings of Jesus. The people, they called him uh, names, and they were, they were worried about his what? Narrow and straight lace, and they, were in, and they said, you are too particular about your scruples, right? Do you remember what a scruple was? It, weigh, it was the weight of a grain of sand. It was nothing. And he was particular about those things. And some people think, oh, you know, why, why pay attention to the small things? But small leaks have sunk many a ship. How, how big of a leak does it take to sink a ship? Any leak. If it's not taken care of, right? <laughs> small leaks. Nothing would serve the purpose 
of any uh, should be allowed to waste. The lack of economy will surely bring debt upon our institutions. Although much money may be received, it will be lost in the little waste of every branch of the work. Economy is not stinginess. So at an institution like this, we have a responsibility. Little leaks can sink many a ships, and in an economy, and in an institution, although there's much money, it can be lost with little wastes in every branch of the line. And so we, as a, we have this counsel. As we're preparing for a time that has soon come upon the world, there is something that we can do in our lives that will help us to be ready, as well as help our institutions to have what we need to be able to not only survive, but to be prepared and to spread the gospel around the world. And now here is the counsel out of 6T, especially for schools and students, not only for the financial welfare of the schools. So it's not talking about just the, the financial welfare of the schools, but also for the education of the students. For the what? So we have a purpose and a reason, not because we're just trying to save money so that we can have more in the school, but it's for your education. Economy should be faithfully studied and conscientiously and diligently practiced. Economy is, is, is re, re, uh, saving and using resources carefully so that we are able to have them and use them properly. The managers must guard carefully every point that there may be no needless expense to bring a burden of debt upon the school. The managers would be your staff. We have this job, we are told. Be careful, guard carefully. And then it goes on. Every student who loves God supremely will help to bear their responsibility in this matter. Those who have been educated to do this can demonstrate by precept and example to those with whom they come in contact that the principles taught by our self-denying redeemer, self-indulgence is a great evil and must be overcome. Now, little lad, he was not self-indulgence. In fact, he sacrificed it. He gave it all. And yet, he got it back, didn't he? And when you sacrifice and you practice economy, it's not a sacrifice. In the end, you'll get it back. God promises. He will give in other ways to, to make up for what that supposed sacrifice is. Now, we must heed the instruction, the other counsel given, for we are nearing the end of time. More and more shall we be obliged to plan, devise, and economize as we are coming closer to the end of time. Do you think we are? Do you think we are? I hope you think we are. It should be, it should be easy to see the signs of the times around us. <laughs> but even if we're not, we are getting closer, aren't we? Even if we're not there quite yet, we're still getting closer. <laughs> So uh, more and more, we shall be obliged to plan, devise, and economize. And then we are told this, there, are, there is no time now to invent ways for using up money. Use your inventive faculties for seeking to economize. <laughs> it's easy to use money, isn't it? I mean, money disappears out of your pockets faster than you can put it in there. It's easy. It's a sieve. Your pockets, they go right through. But we need to use our inventive faculties. So I want to use our inventive faculties this morning to try to figure out some ways that we can economize at an institution like this, that we can save some money. I want to hear some ideas. What are some ways that we waste money? Raise your hand, and I'll call on you. The lights. Do we waste money on lights? If I were to go to the dormitories right now and find out how many lights were left on, would I find any, do you think? Be interesting to do, wouldn't it? Do you know a light bulb burning? A 10, a, 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 a 100 watt light bulb, the old fashioned type, the ones now are getting more efficient, but the 100 watt light bulb burning all night burns about 10 cents. 10 pennies. Doesn't sound like a lot, but if you had all the dormitories, you'd be wasting dollars. And do you know what our electric bill is for a year at Washington Hills? around $50,000. That was a few years ago. $50,000. You might think, Mao, my, my tuition's 900 or whatever, whatever a month. You want to know where a lot of that, most of that, much of that money goes? It goes to the electric company and it goes down the drain to the water company. If you were to add up all of our expenses, just our expenses, we're, we're well over hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in expenses that are outlay of funds that we have no control over. In other words, they come in, we have to pay them out because we owe them. 
you use them. Those are raw expenses, not income, not resources, not buildings, not capital, any of that stuff. That's raw expense. Huge. Lights. If you leave a light on and you're not in the room, what does it benefit? It doesn't benefit anybody. It uses up the electricity and we are having an outgo. And so the problem is this. The problem is not as much the outflow of the means as it is what it's doing to us because we are not being careful about what? Little things. And we are developing a character that is not faithful in little things that is not preparing us for a time of trouble. And when the time of trouble comes, we're not going to have that character that is going to be able to help us by God's grace to be able to stand. Does that make sense? That's why the faithfulness in little things is important. Okay, another area that we waste. Yes? Fans. Fans. Okay. What do fans do in your room? Do they cool your room? Fans do not do anything to cool your room. The only thing they do, and now that is unless you had a fan in your window and it's blowing cool air in your room, <laughs> a ceiling fan we're talking about, the only thing they do is cool people in the room. But if you're not in the room, the fan will run all day and it won't cool your room off when you get back. Does that make sense? It doesn't do any good, so you turn it off when you leave. Now those are simple things, and it's most easy just to forget but if you ask the Lord, this is the thing, if you really, it, it said there, do you remember it said, those who really love God, you remember that quote? It said, those who really, the student who really loves God supremely will help to bear the responsibility in this matter. Now, this is the thing. When you come, when you come to loving God and you simply ask God, God, man, I want to be like you. I want your character in my heart. I want to be ready for when you come back. And I need Jesus because without him, I can't be ready, Right? And the only way I can learn to be faithful then is to have a walk with him now. When the crisis comes, it's going to be too late to develop the walk with Jesus if you haven't had it now, right? Does that make sense? We can't do it all at once. And so it's the day-to-day. And if you tell God and say, God, I want to be like you. I want to be Jesus. I want him dwelling in my heart. I need a righteousness by faith that I don't have. I need Jesus' righteousness to cover me now. Can you give that to me? And can you help me to remember when I'm about ready to walk out of this room and not turn off the light? Because that's a little thing, and I want to be faithful in little things. Is he going to do that? It's not going to be that you're going to, oh, I'm going to turn off, but you're going to be like, ah, and he's going to remind you, turn off that light. <laughs> and we have a choice. We can go, little things, and run off. <laughs> and some of you will do this. You'll get halfway down the hall, and you'll go, oh, oh, no. <laughs> and then you'll run off, because God will remind you halfway to the cafeteria every way. And you know what will be incredibly be a testimony of God's work in your life? When you get halfway to the cafeteria, and you realize you left your light on, and you go back, and you turn it off? You know God's working on your heart because that's not something that's natural. That's self-denial. But God will do something in developing your character and helping you to be ready for this time that's coming. So when it comes, you won't have to worry about it, right? You don't have to worry about the future. You just prepare for it. Make sense? Okay, another way we can, we can, we can economize. Yes, food. <laughs> oh, man, I know. Okay, I grew up and I had to clean my plate. I had to clean my plate and I still do. I can't, st I can't stand wasting my food. My wife, if she's about ready to throw something else, she'll say, Rob, if you don't eat this, I'll throw it away. Of course, that about almost gets me to eat it because I can't. I grew up in a time when my parents, of course, went through the, my dad was born in 1920, 1930. My dad was born in 1930. So what did he grow up in? He grew up in the Great Depression when he was a kid. He knew what it was like to not have. He went door to door selling cottage cheese because they didn't, they had a cow, they owned their home, but they grew most of their stuff, and they, they lived okay, but it was hard times, and he knew, right? And my mom, she was born in 31, and um, they knew, and so I, they kind of instilled that in me. I, I could not leave plate, plate, food on my plate, and um, I went over to my friend's house once, and we were eating spaghetti, and they were not, they, they just, when they were full, they finished, right? But I, I, when I finished, they looked at my plate, and they said, wow, Looks like you licked it. <laughs> I had I'd cleaned it off with my fork, right? And I looked at their plates, and there was just food left all over, and it's like they didn't finish it up. And I, I, I still remember vividly, because it was almost like they were making fun of me, but it was such a habit of mine that I didn't leave any food on my plate. <laughs> I ate it, you know? And, I, and, and, and it cringes me when I see students get the food, peel off all the, and eat the one thing they like, and throw away the rest. Or they have this plate full of food they got, and then they go throw it away. And I'm just like, oh. It cringes me inside because 
it's not so much the waste of food, even though it's a waste of food and it's a waste of money and we shouldn't do that. But what I worry about is what's going on where? Because we are preparing for what is coming upon the world or we're not preparing. Does that make sense? It's the little things that matter and how we use the resources God has given us that we are careful. That's what will prepare us because Jesus will help us if we ask him to. And you might think, man, I just don't like it. But if you ask him, he will help you. If you say, Lord, help me to not take more. Help me to like what I don't like to eat. Because someday when you're in the time of trouble, do you think you might have to, you might have to eat what you don't like to eat? <laughs> might just happen, you know. <laughs> the only thing we are told we are promised is bread and water. That's it. That might get old after a while. <laughs> and it might not be white bread. <laughs> it might be brown bread. <laughs> and we might have to learn to like some things that we don't like to eat someday and so the best way to prepare for that is to learn to like to eat things you don't like to eat now right does that make sense it's not difficult is it it's not rocket science okay other ways that we could prepare we could economize yes Okay, if the AC is on, make sure your windows are closed. Here is a bit of information about electricity and the use. Um, uh, okay, um, let me mention this electricity. Here's the AC. It, it, notice this, for every degree that you raise the setting on an air conditioner, you save about 3 to 5% in your cooling cost. Raising it 1 degree, 3 to 5%, 2 degrees, 10% possibly in your cooling cost. But in our building, this building right here, we have heat pumps. Do you know what that means? You don't know what a heat pump is? A heat pump is an air conditioner in reverse. An air conditioner takes warm air out of your house and blows it outside. Well, it, it, it's kind of the way it works. It really doesn't blow cool in. It takes heat out. But in the wintertime, a heat pump takes heat of the outdoors and blows it in using the same compressor. So essentially heat pumps and air conditioners use the same amount of electricity. Sometimes we think heat is less expensive. It's not. It's the same cost. Actually, it's more expensive because there's less heat outside to bring inside in the wintertime because it's cold. When it gets below 40 out there, your heat pump is ineffective and you have to use electric heat. And so when it's cold out there, the colder it is, the less effective it is. But when it's around here, it's more efficient than at least gas heat and, uh, and raw electric heat. At any rate, I'm just telling you that because in the wintertime, air conditioning and heat, heat are the same value when it comes to um, the amount of energy that it takes to produce it, essentially here in, the, in, our build, in this building. Your buildings, you're in the dorms, of course, you have wood heat, so it's a little different. At least sometimes you do anyway, if we're running them. But if you, could, if you have a window open, which I do, I walk in, and the, the windows are, the, are open, especially in the wintertime. They want fresh air, so they open them. The cold air comes in. We're running the heat. So where's our heat going? Out the window. And we're running it, and it running it, and running it. And that's the way we use it. Okay, so making sure the windows are closed and we're, we're using it. Now, you know, or turn the temperature down, which you can't do in this building, but if you had the control of your thermostat, could be able to turn the temperature down, you'll save a lot. Okay, anywhere else that you can save some money? Yes. Water. Water. Water is a huge, is a huge um, thing here and that we are using. Um, ROHA, um, uh, this was a few years ago, but about $600 a month in water. That's just this one meter. That's not all the other meters. If we add all the other buildings that we pay together, which is $60 a month per building, raw, 69 I think it is, for water in, city, in the city limits, even if you didn't use it, you would get charged that a month. On all the other buildings, I mean, it's much more than this. These are, these are just the one, one meter there. It was around $600 a month just in water use. And you know how much that is? I mean, water is, we used, we used this is back in, a few years ago, but um, 72 gallons per person per day on campus when the people we had living there. 72 gallons per person per day uh, in you know, 72 gallons. You know, a 50 gallon barrel? It's almost, you know, what? One and a half of those per person per day. If you can put 50 gallons barrels for every person of you, the water we use in here, <laughs> per person per day on average, you know, it's a considerable amount of money. And um, 
that's from August to December, we used that year seven, almost three quarters of a million gallons of water at Washington Hills. <laughs> Twice the industrial global average of 31. On average, industrialized countries use 31 gallons per person per day. At OHA, we used twice that, that year. <laughs> and um, what about this? A lot of people, they blow their nose or they have a tissue and they put it in the toilet and they flush it. Every time you do that, you just used one and a half gallons is the new standard per flush. And what are you flushing? You're not only flushing the tissue, but that water that goes down the drain costs something. And you're flushing money down the drain. Don't flush <laughs> tissue down the drain. Put it in the waste paper basket. Every time you flush, it is, um, I, uh, it is a, a, a use of money. What about this one? When you go in the cafeteria, you rip off one of those paper towels after you wash your hands, which I hope you do. I hope you wash your hands and rip off a paper towel. <laughs> I get done at worship last week, and I saw four people after worship go into the, cafe, into the um, bathrooms to wash their hands before they went through line. Now they had come in. Maybe they had washed their hands before they left, but they walked from the dorm, came into worship, got up from worship, and went through line, didn't go wash their hands, didn't use a hand sanitizer. Of course, they're not serving themselves. They're just serving themselves now. They're not serving all that stuff. You know, but nonetheless, washing their hands is supposed to be important. But if you watch people, when they get the paper towel, what do they do? Almost always. They get one, and it comes back out, and they get another one. It's convenient. It's nice. It dries your hands better. But if you will think about it, try to see if you can really dry your hands well with one towel. By the time you're done, the towel is pretty well saturated, and you can throw it away, but your hands are almost dry. Not completely, but almost dry. And every time I pull it off, I think about the fact I can use one or I can use two. And if everybody used two, we use twice as much as if everybody used one. We would immediately cut our expense on paper towels in half if everybody only used one, if everybody had been using two. Does that make sense? And that would be an expense we could save. But it's not the expense that's a problem. What is it? It's our character development for what is coming upon the world as an overwhelming surprise one day that we are preparing for or we're not preparing for, right? We don't worry about it. We just prepare for it. And by studying God's word, and by at least this is one area, there's other ways, but we can economize. And I would suggest that, okay, that we could just conscientiously only use one towel and that would be it. Um, any other areas? Oh, by the way, here's something interesting. The average amount of water used per day by a person living in Ethiopia, Eritrea, if you pronounce that correct, Abish, Djibouti, Somalia, Mali, Mozambique, Tanzania, Uganda is the same as someone in a developed country doing which of the following? A, cleaning their teeth while using the tap, while having the tap running, filling a dishwasher about 65 liters, or taking a bath. Which one do you think it is? It is cleaning their teeth. That we use, if you are brushing your teeth and you leave the water running while you brush the teeth and then you spit it out and rinse out your toothbrush, you have just used more water than a person in those countries has available to them for cooking, washing, and bathing, and everything for an entire day. Total water consumption, eating and drinking too. You just wasted that going down the drain. Did it, do, did it benefit you at all while you were brushing your teeth while the water was running? <laughs> it went right down the drain. Turn off the water. Is that a simple thing you could do? Now, it's hard to remember, but if you ask God, God, I want, to be, I want to be ready for the day that Jesus comes back and for this world. Help me to prepare now. Help me to learn to be faithful on little things. He will remind you. You're brushing your teeth. Turn off the water. <laughs> Turn it off. Brush your teeth. In fact, I don't even like to sit there. I want to do something while I'm brushing my teeth, so I just brush my teeth, and I walk around the house, and I take off my shoes, and then I keep brushing, and then I, <laughs> I'm getting ready for bed so that I don't waste my time. I'm actually brushing my teeth while I'm getting something else accomplished. Um, and then you go in, you turn off the water. You can also do that when you have to wash your hands for 20 seconds. Get some water and soap on them, turn off the water and wash them for 20 seconds, and then turn the water back on and rinse them off. Little things that you can do, and I can do, that would save money. But more than that, it is preparing our what? Our heart, our characters for what is soon to come upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Um, okay, so any other ways that we could economize? You can think of. Those are some practical, simple things. If we all just did little things, it, we would stop those little leaks and increase a lot. Short showers. Short showers. 
Those showers are nice. But your water is running down the drain, but it also took heat to heat that water, energy to heat the water, and so you have a double use of resources, water and energy, to be able to take a shower. If you could reduce the shower, you would reduce it significantly. And thinking about that, thinking, wow, I'm taking a short shower not because I'm saving money, but because I'm preparing my character for what Jesus is going to do someday in my life and in this world so that I can be faithful when he comes back. Is that what you want? Do you want to be faithful when he comes? It's knowing him. It's walking with him, and he will help you. He will remind you. He will assist you. That's his goal. His goal is character development in your life, and when we ask him, he will help us. And that's the wonderful thing. And I know, it's a, I mean, I've experienced myself. He reminds us, be faithful. And oh, yeah, because I want to be like him. And that's the only way that you can be prepared for what will come upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. So we're going to go camping this weekend. And uh, sometimes it's a hardship. We're sleeping on the ground. Is that good pre preparation? Might have to do it someday. When I was talking to the ranger about us going camping, he's like, you all need to go to Laurel Creek. Now, you might get a, you'll get a chance to see Laurel Creek because we're going to go there and do cleanup. Um, I was talking with him. They're very generous. Um, we were going to go to a place that had no showers because it was free. We were going to take you to a shower that was a mile away, but we'd have to transport you. You could bring a showers and then come back and then transport in the evening. But that was going to be a hassle. But it was free. And we would say, you know what it's going to, it would cost us around to go camping this weekend? Just in the paying the park, somewhere between four and $500. Just in paying the, uh, the fees, $16 a site, depending for, you know, four, ni five, four nights times, depending on how many six or eight sites, whatever it is we need. So it doesn't sound like much, but hey, that's six or five or four, three, three to six hundred dollars, something like that. that sounds like more. I mean, you, you have three hundred, four hundred dollars you just want to spend, you know? Neither does the school, right? And right with COVID right now, everything's tight. And so we're like, let's go to the free place. Well, they were very kind in that if we will exchange some help with them, they will allow us to camp at the place that has the showers and allow us, like they've done this with Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts will camp there sometimes and they will do some service projects. And I'm like, we're all into service projects. We love, we go out hiking, we go out working together. It's honestly, in my opinion, it's far more fun to work together hard than it is to play together hard. If you get out there and you're helping others, like, like disaster relief, you're helping them. You come back so satisfied. You know somebody was blessed and you worked hard and is nice. And so we're going to get the chance to go out and do some work, we hope. And it's going to be at Laurel Creek. It's a little drive away. But Laurel Creek is off the grid. <laughs> You drive a five-mile dirt road, there's only one pit toilet, and there's a campground out in the middle of the National Forest. And the ranger said to me, you need to take them and have them camp out at Laurel Creek. That would be a good experience for them. <laughs> That's what he said. A hardship that might be good preparation for the time of trouble, you think? <laughs> We're not going to go there to camp, by the way. <laughs> But it was tempting in my mind. That's what we do when we go backpacking, by the way. We, that's preparation for the time of trouble. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, you gotta use nature's call when you, when restroom, when restroom uh, urges come. Um, anyway, um, sleeping on the ground is not a bad preparation for the time of trouble. Could be anyway, right? And it's not that we're preparing because we're trying to prep ourselves for the time of trouble. No, we need a connection with Jesus. We need a character with him that's going to be faithful in little things. We know him now, and when we know him now, he's going to walk with us through the time of trouble. You don't have to worry about the time of trouble. You just have to worry about preparing for it. Does that make sense? We study God's word. Remember, that's what we do, and we prepare by uh, asking him to come and change our hearts, and he'll do it. He'll help us, and together, if we economize, we'll have a better school. We'll have better characters. We'll know Jesus better for ourselves because he'll be helping us in that way and when he helps you and you know him you'll have something you can share with others and that's the best preparation for the time of trouble let's uh let's pray father in heaven we're thankful that your word teaches us something and you gave the story of the feeding of the five thousand as an illustration of what how we should live and you could have stopped it without having 12 baskets of food left over and yet you gave it as an example to us to be careful to pick up the fragments and that nothing be lost. We are to be careful in little things. Lord, I pray that you would help us this year that we indeed would be faithful to know that we are doing what we can, 
But most importantly, I pray that you would work in our hearts. We need characters that are ready for that which is coming upon this world. And we are often too indolent to obtain the preparation. We don't have to worry about the time of trouble. We just need to prepare for it by studying your word, by being faithful in little things and, and putting your word into practice in our lives. We can't do it by ourselves, Lord. We need Jesus. We need his righteousness working in us that helps us and that changes us. And without it, which, Father, if we just try to turn off the lights more and save water by ourselves, really we're not accomplishing anything as far as preparation without Jesus' righteousness enabling us and empowering us and giving us that still small voice inside of us that helps us to do what is right. We really are lost, Father, and one day we'll be lost. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us the righteousness of Christ today. And as we go out in nature, as we spend time there, that you would give us a heart to know you, to do what is right, and to be really amongst those that are seeking and longing for that preparation uh, that uh, will enable them to walk with you through the time of trouble one day soon. We pray in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching our assembly here at Watch the Hills. We hope you receive precious information. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. Also, tap that notification bell before you go so that you know when we upload the next program. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Links are in the description below. Have a great day, and until next time, be well.